Hi everyone, I'll stand over here so this can hear me. So I'm in the computer science department. I'm in the, specifically in the systems research group there. So it's the group that's interested in networking and operating systems and basically how the internet works and how it's all put together. I'm not a computer scientist by training. So my background, as Alex said, was physics undergrad. Then I did a neuroscience PhD studying human behavior. And then I joined the software industry as a product manager and I worked on software products. So I understand software, but I don't necessarily write a huge amount of code myself. So I'm going to describe briefly the kind of work we're doing and what I think about the Internet of Things. Is that a phrase that anyone's heard of before? Okay. <laughs> and the kind of work that we're doing to help put people back in control of their digital life, their, their digital experience. So many people have talked about, uh, if you read The Economist and other places, about the, the growth of this thing called the Internet of Things, the explosion of mobile devices, phones being everywhere, toasters that can tweet, um, electronic scales that uh, broadcast your weight to all your friends on Facebook, all this kind of stuff. And this has come from a trend of really, really big computers that used to be um, in buildings, moving, becoming smaller and smaller, uh, more and more powerful, and being able to be deployed in more and more places. So if you continue this trend on, we're going to end up in a place that has about 10 billion devices out there, 10 billion. And what are they, what are they all going to do? And how are they all going to talk to each other? So, just to give you an idea of the kinds, if you have questions, please do interrupt. So, just to give you an example, just a visualization of what these devices are like. So, this is the this is the Withing scale, and that one basically tweets your weight. If you stand on it, it will send a, a Twitter message out on your tweet stream about how much you weigh. I'm not sure why I would want to do this. I can't imagine my girlfriend would want to do this, but people do. And this on the top right is something called the little printer. So this is a physical object that, again, collates information from your social streams and can print you out a nice little report in the morning. So it can uh, print you out a little update of what your friends have been doing on Facebook or what the weather's going to be like today. Again, it's connected to the internet, which is how it gets its information. On the bottom left here, we have the Nest, which is a uh, smart thermostat for the house. So it learns about, instead of you having to program it, it learns about your movements through the house. It has various sensors. It will then work out what, uh, when you're home, when you're not home, adjust the temperature accordingly. When, there are, when there's more than one person in the house, it will be able to take account of that. So it's an intelligent device. It's also connected to the internet, sends its information up back to the home company service to then do a whole bunch of data analysis to then program your device. This on the bottom right is a Fitbit, which basically is a little device that you wear, and it monitors your movements and then gives you a report on how many steps you took today, how many calories you may have burned. And again, it will connect to the internet and dump all of its data into a store somewhere where you can analyze it and look at the look at the pretty little graphs and stuff. So all of these things are examples of devices, the examples of the things in the Internet of Things, because each of these devices is connected to the Internet in some way. The key thing about the things in the Internet of Things is they are either sensors, so they record information about the world, or they are actuators, so they, brought, so they can perform some kind of effect in the world. For example, the, the thermostat can uh, create some kind of effect in the world by adjusting your, your boiler. It's just in a temperature of your boiler. So all of these things typically connect to some big central service somewhere that people think of as being called the cloud. Now that's all great and we get lots of good things from this. And those centralized services have grown very big. So on the, on the left here we have a bunch of pros of having those big centralized services. So you get identity from them. So everyone can, so you can define who people are and you can create connections between those different people based on some kind of identity. And so all these services like Google, Apple, and Facebook provide some form of identity for your life online. You also get access to it and visibility. Um, you can connect to the internet, like this cloud, the centralized services via Wi-Fi. From here, you can connect to the, the big services. You can connect via your phone over 3G, um, and even through your phone line. So you have access pretty, from pretty much everywhere to these this big centralized services. It's reliable because there's lots of very, very smart people whose job it is to make sure these services keep running. And people like to share stuff. So this is an easy way of people being able to connect to each other if they're all ending up in one place. But there are also downsides to this as well. Most of these big centralized services make their money by taking that aggregated data and finding ways to make money from it, which is typically advertising. So Google is the most obvious example. It, it knows a lot about you, so it will then try and tailor those ads to you. Whereas I don't necessarily want to see any ads, I just want the service. Security also becomes an issue because you have all your stuff in 
one big place. So anyone who wants to attack it just has to attack one big place. And so that, can, that adds to the risk. It's expensive for these companies to run because they have these giant servers, a huge energy costs, and lots and lots of staff trying to keep them running all the time. And they only work when you're online. So right now, if we lost internet connectivity, lots of things on my computer will probably fail. My email will probably stop working. My, um, my Dropbox, which is syncing my folders, will probably stop working because that's, I need those, those services just to move files around. So availability is an issue. So this, uh, an analogy that we've used before is that this is like renting versus buying. So when you own a home, you own all the bits in it, and it's your job to maintain all the bits in it. If you rent a house, you generally shout at the landlord to fix things. So at the moment, we rent all these cloud services. I effectively rent my email from Gmail because they show me advertising, which I never click on, and I use their email service. I rent my social life from Facebook because they help me connect to all my friends, and then they try and show me ads, which I also don't click on. So I'm renting all these services. Essentially what I want is I want to be able to have my own personal cloud, my own method of connecting to people, my own method of having applications that do things for me in the cloud without needing to, and being able to control my digital footprint without having to give up too much of my, my life to these third party services. So how do we connect people's things then? Because at the moment all these things are connected to individual disparate services in the cloud. So, one of the, so there's a bunch of challenges we have to fix here. How do we connect people's things? So what's difficult about doing this? Firstly, it's some, the lack of end-to-end -end connectivity. So this phone can't necessarily find out where that laptop is. So even though they're right next to each other, unless I do some fancy, fancy gadgetry on my phone, it's not necessarily going to be able to connect to my laptop or vice versa. They can both, however, connect to somewhere centrally up in the cloud. And that's how most of the synchronization is done. But if I just want to send a photo from my phone, literally, to my laptop, the easiest way for me to do that at the moment is still by email. So there's a problem of con Bluetooth. I have not set up Bluetooth, and in, in fact, that is a directory. And in fact, Bluetooth profiles on this particular phone don't work. So I don't think I can do that. So I'm restricted by the stuff on the device, even though it has Wi-Fi. I can't make the same connection over Wi-Fi unless I set up my own little Wi-Fi hotspot. In other words, I've got to do a lot of stuff where it should be really simple because I just want to get a file from here to here. And to do that at the moment, it involves sending it all the way up there and all the way back down again. So connectivity is a problem. The next problem is identity. Because if you take away the stuff that centralized services are providing, how do I know who, who is what? How do I know that this phone is actually my phone? Or that this laptop, or the laptop I'm trying to connect to is actually one of my laptops and not some random person that's inserted themselves into the process. And the related to that is security. So I'm going to describe, firstly, the background of how the, what the internet kind of looks like now, how we got to where we are, um, why these things have become problems, and what we're trying to do to solve them. So way back in the day, we had the internet with one machine on it. And that one machine would have an IP, something called an IP address, which would basically be like the phone number of, of the machine. That would be connected by some provider, so for example, AOL or, or um, FreeServe, if anyone remembers those back in the day. So you connect to your ISP, they'd provide you a whole bunch of services, and then you'd have access to the internet. But your machine would have an IP address, and that would be visible everywhere. So if you gave someone your IP address, they'd be able to basically phone your machine, by and large. So then you have more machines on the internet, so now it becomes more useful, because now the two machines have someone to talk to. They can now talk to each other. So this machine can now reach that uh, machine by using the number. So that and that is visible across the network. And that's all fine too. But now we introduce this little gizmo here. So you can imagine this is a router in your house. So this, what this is doing is something called network address translation and that. So what that means is this number, this is the phone number now for your connection to the internet, your, your IP address. That's actually being shared across all of these devices now, behind the app. So for example, this could be my, let's say, my TV, and this could be my laptop. So they're connecting to my router at home, and my router is talking to the internet. But if this machine now wants to talk to my TV for some reason, it can't, because it can only reach this one. So unless I do some clever stuff here before I leave the house, 
then I can't leave a hole open, a little channel open, so that this machine can now talk to the TV. So now we've introduced a problem. We've broken something called the end-to-end -end principle. So the end-to-end -end principle basically means like all the nodes on the network can find each other and talk to each other. They can make a connection between the two of them and pass information between the two of them. That's gone now because of the introduction of devices like these. Now, these were necessary because it means you can have only one address here and you don't have to manage a whole, a whole bunch of them, but it breaks the ease of communication across the network. Does that part make sense? Okay. So now we continue and more of these devices appear. And so now we have more problems because now this machine originally could have talked to that machine. Now, well, now it can't. So this one could be my department. So my department will also have its own little router, its own little box. And it does provide protection because it stops random attacks coming into all the machines. And it can block off certain access, block off certain access. But again, it's now harder for things to connect to each other. So now we end up with more centralized services. So these services can act as places in the middle where you can go and do stuff, and then other devices can come along and also do stuff somewhere on these machines because they can all connect to the internet this way. Is this making sense? So, so what we have now is this side is what we call well, colloquially we're calling the edge network. So this is the edge of the, the, the internet. So it's where we're, it's basically where we all live. So this is this you can consider this a device on the edge of the network. You can consider the core of the network is the stuff where all the big servers live. So Amazon's huge data centers, <coughs> Google's data centers, you can consider that the, the core. That's what people would consider to be the cloud. So we all live out here on the edge, and those are all my devices. And this is what my devices have to do to get to the internet. And they're not even the internet uh, at this stage. So if you have a phone, you have to uh, go through various routers, various middle boxes. This is what we call these things, middle boxes. They sit in the way between where you are and wherever you're trying to get to. So it's fine when you're trying to connect to stuff like this because they're all somewhere else and they're all trying to connect up somewhere to the cloud. So information flow this way, connectivity this way, is fine. And these services have grown quite fat on this. The fact that you can always get to this place in the middle, so you just have to make all your devices be able to talk to these things, and then these things can do all the coordination for you. So you end up having an account with each of these places. So dump all data in the cloud. When people say to the cloud, this is kind of what they're talking about. But really, this is what I actually want. I don't much care about what's happening on this side. I want to get a picture from here to there. I don't much care what, what route it takes. But the end goal is I want to have something that goes from this device to that device. And I want whatever's on this device to be backed up. Whatever's on this device to be backed up to this device. And why can't this stuff happen all the way over here? Why does it need to travel all the way out here and then all the way back again in terms of the coordination? To, to, to allow that to happen. So what we're, trying to, uh, what we're trying to enable is personal device connectivity because that's actually what's going to be at the core of putting users back in control of their networks. So you need to build, help people build their own little internet around, around themselves to start with, and we're calling that signposts. So the user experience here will matter. So I'll, descri I'll describe in more detail how this is going to work. So we essentially use domain names because everyone knows how domain names work. And the idea is that you should be able to use a name for your device. So for example, I could call this mac.amirmt.io. And then when I call that name from wherever I am, something should happen in the background. So then say, here is the access point to, your, to the device you asked for, no matter where I am. And it should be the shortest route. It should be the best route for what I'm trying to do at the time, whether that be sending a photo or accessing the device to do something else. And that should happen without me needing to do much stuff. And so what we, what we do is use the DNS system. So when I say DNS, that's the domain name server. That's essentially the something something dot something. So in this case, mamc.io or uh, darwin.cam.ac.uk, that's all using the domain name system of the internet. So people already are uh, familiar with these names. So what we're asking them to do is to, what we're asking them to do is to define names for their devices. So here's what that would look like. So I have something very small very kind of lean, uh, running somewhere up in the cloud, somewhere that I control. So that's my domain. I have that. And I have this little piece of software running up there that I've just taken, open source project, I've taken, I'll follow the instructions, and there it is, it lives somewhere. We'll worry about the details of that later. When you say you have it, you, you mean you really do have it? This is something you created? 
yes. But it's not ready for uh, other people to use yet because it's kind of broken. <laughs> Bits of it work. And we have, we've got a deadline for the end of the month for a conference to try and get it working better. <laughs> so we have this thing that runs up somewhere, runs somewhere here. And I have mine. I actually don't have mine, but this, this would be mine. And this actually knows, keeps track of where all my stuff is. So uh, every now and again, my stuff will pull this device say, hey, I'm here now. So it'll send the information on where it is and how to connect to it. And this just keeps basically a short list of how that, what that is, what that information is. And so each of the devices just does that. And then when one of the devices wants to talk to another device, let's say I want to send a picture or some device, something from my phone to my laptop for some reason, my phone will simply ask my signpost and the request will simply be, where is this? Give me, give me this. And because this has already had the answer, it will simply return that result and say, here's how you connect to this device. And what that will do in the background is actually make a connection through here, force this to open up a port to uh, make an access tunnel so that you can reach this. And then it will send that information back to the phone. So when the phone tries to connect this, the pathway still runs through here, but it's now been opened and, se and secured for use by the phone. Does that make sense? Okay. Still going up and back. Still going up and back, but you need something in the middle to act as a coordination point. It doesn't need to do anything more than act as a coordination point, but it needs something needs to be running up there. So, so without this, what happens? How do you get through, through that problem? Without this, I have to know how this works, and I have to configure this to, to leave something open, so that, and I have to remember what that thing is that I left open. So in other words, I leave a window open. And that's done sort of offline ahead of time. Oh, well, I would have to do that while I'm here, on this side. Mm -hmm. So I would have to know. I would have, basically have to leave a window open in this house. Then when I go away, I have to know. I have to tell my phone uh, this is the back window on the top left that I left open for you. No one else knows about it, but that's the one that's open for you. Whereas what we're doing now is this guy has keys. Right. So, so this guy will go into the house and open up the back window, and then tell the other guy I left the back window open for you. So this can stay secure most of the time. Does that make sense? Yeah. It has, yes, it has effect in the, yes, it has effect in the network. So it changes some of this, changes the network to allow this connection to happen. So that solves, that would solve one of these problems, which is if the, the connectivity, because you can have that connectivity running through something that you control. You can bind all your devices to it. So I can have my phone, my laptop, my computer in the laboratory, and my backup drive at home, all talking to my signpost. And once they are all bound and authenticated and secured, talking to my signpost, then I can reach any of them from any of the other devices. So I then have my own little personal network, which is great. Then the next problem is we don't have actually any identity online. Well, that's actually solved because we've just given everyone a DNS name. So everyone on the planet would now have something like this. And a lot of people already have this. So that can act as my identity. And it's not, and it um, looks quite similar to email addresses anyway. That's actually not my email address, but it looks very similar to email addresses so people can understand what this means. So this is me, for example. Someone with a different name will be someone else. I could have multiple ones of these if I wanted to. So, go ahead. And there's a system to ensure that two people can't have the same. That already exists. So if, I, if someone tried to buy this domain name, so these domain names are handled by domain name registrars. So if I, someone else tried to buy this domain name, they would say, sorry, this one's already gone. How does it know that it's you accessing it, not me? That's the, that's the bit I haven't talked about, which is this, this. No, that's fine. I'm, I'm actually not actually going to go into it. It's the security extensions. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of um, cryptography and security stuff built into something called DNSSEC, which uh, um, .io is one of the things that is signed to use that. So that's how I know that when my phone is actually connecting, but I'll ask for it, that it is actually my phone, because it sends an extra piece of information, an extra secret that only my phone could know. So you then take all the devices and bind those devices to your name. And that's the example of like PC.AmirNT or Phone.AmirNT. So I can have as many of those devices as I want. They're all bound to my, to my name. And that's how I know that they're me. I'm going to skip this one. And you can have them. Um, so this is an example of an individual signpost. So these could be the ones running my own devices. But you could also have them that are running um, for um, a commercial organ an organization as well. 
So an organization could have its own set of signposts and set up its rules for how things talk to each other. So all these devices can still form a connection to my devices if they're authenticated properly. So it doesn't have to be entirely personal. It can also be organizational as well. So, and and work PC and Amir PC could be the same machine with different manuals? They could be, yes. So that's helped us figure out the identity question as well in, in one fell swoop because we're just using the existing name system of the internet that people are already familiar with. Now the, the, the final point is security. Actually, before we get onto that one. So this is now what personal cloud could look like. So I have my version of my little signpost. Uh, my department has its own little version. We set up trusted links between them, between certain uh, parts of them, and they can all now find each other and talk to each other on the network. So I have this little, I have my own little cloud of devices that can find each other on the network and do, in do interesting things with each other. The security aspect, we're dealing with in a slightly different way. So there's a couple of people in the laboratory building a completely new operating system. <coughs> so an operating system that is designed to run on the internet, on parts of the internet. So it doesn't, it's not like, not like the operating system that runs here that has to deal with lots of the hardware issues or or Windows. It's an operating system that's designed to run very, very small, very, very lean on something like a server that lives somewhere somewhere else that someone else is maintaining. But it's completely secure so that it's difficult, very difficult for someone to break into it. And if they did, they're not really going to learn very much. So that, that will take care of the security story. And I will skip that too. So we've basically solved what we think of the big research challenge, well, will have solved what we think are the big research challenges there. But that's only part of the story because it's only good if it gets out in the world. So something we need to do is try and get people using this stuff. It's one of the reasons that doing talks is good. So we first need to create the software and then push it out there and then see how people use it and encourage them to use it. Because if people start using their own networks and they can do things, you can do things with them that you couldn't do before, that provides usefulness to people. And usefulness is what will um, promote adoption. And so that will be the next step further on. It then stops being research and starts being more technology transfer. But that would ultimately be the aim if we, if we really want to help people uh, put themselves at the center of their digital lives. So part of this will be um, creating some kind of not-for-profit open source software foundation to help manage all these software projects because we need to uh, develop a community of other people who are writing patches, contributing code, writing applications that use this, this infrastructure. If, you, if you're interested to sign up for more information about that, you can visit that website. And the idea there is you should have some kind of distributed app store. So instead of having some centralized place, you want to be able to take these app, take applications that other people have written and then deploy them everywhere at once. So I don't necessarily have to worry about how it works on my phone or my laptop or somewhere else. It's just I want this application. To, for example, I want to move away from Gmail onto a new email provider. And that should just find its way onto my devices once I've allowed it to. So it shouldn't require a huge amount of configurability. And I should stop there. Just, and just to remind you, the whole point of this is to enable devices like these to be under the user's control <coughs> and within the user's um, environment, rather than sending everything in, so having to connect to third-party services for everything, given that most of the things that third-party services do is connect between them. And I should stop there.